All right, welcome to the Going Ballistic Podcast. I'm Ryan Kleckner. You're listening to episode number seven. If you like what you hear, please, please, please subscribe and leave feedback on iTunes. Uh, those are going to help this podcast succeed and help others find us. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Facebook, both under Ryan Kleckner. And I mean it, guys. If, if you'd like to support the podcast, leaving that feedback, uh, even just word of mouth, telling others about it, is really what's going to help. Uh, a ton of you guys are listening so far. I, I'm, I'm shocked and pleasantly surprised. But for the past few podcasts, the number's staying the same, which means you need to go tell more people. I, I'd really appreciate it if you did. Um, today, we're going to be doing a live Q&A. Jason can't make it tonight. So I'm going to be addressing some of the emails and some of the topics that have come in. Uh, but as you know, if you've been following along, the last few podcasts have been uh, with my cousin Jason, a little more conversational format. And we even started a new project for the last podcast, uh, Building Jason's AR-15. And I'm hoping to have, I don't know, maybe 10 different podcasts that are going to be covering that topic. And we can build it together as we go through it with Jason. We can talk about some of the parts he's finding, some of the things like that. Uh, this podcast is going to be produced at least every week, and the notes about each show are going to be found at goingballisticpodcast.com forward slash the show's number. So, for example, since this is episode number seven, you're going to find notes for this particular episode at goingballisticpodcast.com forward slash seven, as in the number seven. If you're looking to learn more about long-range shooting, I'd appreciate it if you guys checked out my book. It's the Long Range Shooting Handbook. It's available on Amazon.com in both paperback and Kindle versions. Uh, it's also available on iTunes as well. Uh, I donate 25% of the proceeds from uh, all book sales to two military charities. It's the Sua Sponte Foundation and the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. So not only do I like it when you buy books, uh, they like it too. All right, so let's get to the show. I think I already mentioned... This is going to be the live Q&A, so if you're on Facebook following along right now, I appreciate it. Welcome. How are you? Uh, go ahead and please leave some comments and questions as we go, and I'll try the best I can to respond to them. I've shared this on a couple pages. I have it on the, both the Going Ballistic Podcast Facebook page and also the Long Range Shooting Handbooks Facebook page. Uh, if you want the comment to be addressed live, please make sure you go to the podcast page. Uh, so if you're on the Long Range Shooting Handbook page, go just click that link, jump on over, and that's where I'll be monitoring uh, to see what you guys uh, wanna know, what you're curious about, see how you're tuning in, things like that. So first, uh, some of the emails that have been coming in, uh, Cole sent an email, uh, thanks for writing in Cole, that said something to the effect of how he liked my videos on YouTube, which uh, I appreciate it. Those, those were more successful than we ever expected, and and I hope the, the new uh, YouTube channel that I'm starting uh, within the next couple of weeks is going to be just as successful. So he liked those videos. He went through the series. And then he said years later, he, he bought my book, not realizing the connection. And he was as he's reading through the book, he's thinking, hey, this guy kind of sounds a lot like that guy from the videos. And he looked it up and lo and behold, it's the same guy. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, I think I've been... My name has been recognized like maybe five times. So there's one, Cole. So I appreciate it. Uh, and I appreciate the kind words. Uh, Eli had a good question about how to start at the range. And that's actually, uh, John also wrote in to me and had another question we'll address next. But he also was asking what my typical trip to the range looks like. So maybe we'll cover that. Uh, I, I cover all the things in the book and the videos about, you know, what to do at home and some of the fundamentals where you're at the range, you know, what you need to consider at the range, but never really what you do when you get there. So I also mentioned fundamentals. Uh, that's going to be a topic later too. I'm, I'm going to explain how you should listen to what I tell you the fundamentals are, but then also how you should ignore them, how maybe they're not the right answer after all. So I'll explain that just a bit. So how do you start at the range? Well, if I have a new rifle, uh, I'm going to do most of the work I can at home because although you can bring your tools to the range, you can do stuff out there, you're going to lose screws, you're going to uh, have a much harder time doing it than you, you would be at home. So I'm going to take the time to mount my scope at home. I'm going to make sure the scope's level. I'm going to make sure the rifle fits to me. In the NSSF video, I make the analogy when you have a scope fit you on the rifle that if you don't have the rifle set up for you, you're never going to get the performance out of it that you want. It would be like a race car driver having to jump into a rental car when the seats and the steering wheel and the mirrors aren't adjusted for them. 
they might be good. They might be able to get some performance out of it, but they're never going to reach the full potential they can unless it truly fits them. Well, I think the same thing is true for a rifle and scope combination. If you're straining, your, your neck muscles are going to start shaking. You're not going to see the, the picture clearly. You're not going to be consistent from shot to shot. It's just going to be not a fun trip to the range. So take your time and get that set up first at home because somebody else even wrote in and said that they went to the range and just got it all zeroed, then heard me talk about scope setup. And although they were happy to learn, they're a little bummed out because now that meant they had to uh, uh, go start all over again because they're going to have to get the scope set up for themselves and it's not going to work. So make sure you get it set up first in the first place before you go out there. So, but once you got the rifle set up, once you got the scope set up, once you think you're ready to go and you have whatever ammo you want to start with, which by no means does it need to be the best ammo. Don't even go out there with the super expensive high speed match grade stuff if you don't want. If you just want to get familiar with the rifle, make sure it functions and get it semi zeroed, you might as well use the cheap ammo for that. Well, when I get to the range of a brand new gun, I'm going to bore sight it. I really do. Or at least start at 25 yards. I'll do one or the other. I usually don't do both. Now, bore sighting, uh, as some of you may know, means you take the bolt out of the gun and you look through the bore. You look through the barrel at the target. You're going to really need to make sure the rifle's steady when you do this. So uh, this is where I really like the sandbags or nice rests to put on the rifle. Uh, for semi-autos like AR-15s, you can actually crack the upper open a little bit to take the bolt out and then leave it cracked open. Some people call it shotgunned because you leave the front takedown pin in. You just take the rear takedown pin out and you need to be able to see through the barrel. Well, you get it as stable as possible. And you look through the barrel at the distance you're going to be shooting. So let's say 100 yards. at something you can see at 100 yards. And take your time to get as accurate as possible with the, the barrel lined up pointing directly at the target. Now, the barrel is going to look like two rings. You're going to see the ring that's closest to your eye, kind of the chamber. And you're going to see the ring at the end. And you're just going to see some barrels and, and some rifling in between. It's kind of like uh, the beginning of a James Bond movie when you see the barrel come out, right? So if you focus on those two rings, the end of the barrel, and the chamber, and you take your time and you, you center them. You, you make sure that the two rings kind of line up or are centered first, then you move them to the target. If you don't do that, uh, you're gonna have the same problem as you know sight alignment and sight picture that we've, we talked about before, and of course I'll harp on in the future, is if they're not lined up and you're focusing only at the target, you're not gonna realize that your barrel is actually crooked. So make sure your barrel's lined up perfectly centered with those two circles, then make sure they're pointed directly at whatever you're aiming at. And now here's the trick as best as you can, without disturbing the rifle's position, you're gonna bring your head up and look through the scope and see if the scope is anywhere close to what you're looking at. Then you're gonna have to go back and forth a couple times, or at least I do. I have to put my head back low, look through the barrel, back up, look through the scope, and then make bold adjustments. Take those turrets and move that reticle, bold adjustments where you need to go. And you can figure out which way to do it by trial and error, but remember, move opposite to move the reticle, right? So you're going to move the bullet, impact of the bullet up. You need to actually move the reticle down because that's going to make you then raise the rifle. So if your reticle is too high, don't look at your turret and move it the down direction. That down direction means bullet impact goes down. You're going to move the reticle down. You actually have to move the bullet impact up. So sorry about that. If that confuses you, if you get it wrong, don't worry. You'll see the reticle go the wrong way and you'll figure out uh, the error of your ways and you can fix it. But you make some bold adjustments and then get back and look through the barrel. Make sure it's lined up again and then back up through the scope, barrel and scope. You do that back and forth and get yourself at least on paper, you're going to have a much better time hitting it. Now, uh, when I used to be teaching uh, sniper students all the time, uh, the other instructor and I out there would sometimes compete on who could get closest. And I forget who it was, honestly, but one of us got within a couple of minutes one time of the bullseye, maybe one minute, uh, which was just maybe pure luck. But almost every time, we could at least get on paper so you know where you're going to be hitting. You're not going to be wasting ammo, and even worse, uh, maybe you know shooting around over the berm and being unsafe. So once I bore sight, or I zero at 25 yards. So let's talk about that real quick. Zeroing at 25 yards just puts the target so close that sure you can bore sight too, but it's probably going to be somewhere on the paper that close that you can at least shoot one round. I won't even shoot a group at 25 yards. I'll just shoot one round because I'm making a bold adjustment. And all I'm trying to do is make sure that I'm going to be on paper at 100 yards. So who cares if it's precise at 25? The only thing you need to remember is when you see that impact on the paper at 25 yards, you're going to need to move four times as much as you would at 100 yards. So if you need a refresher, go back either that section of the book or go back to the podcast that I talk about minutes of angle or mills. 
and realize that even though a minute of angle is about one inch at 100 yards, and it's about two inches at 200 yards and so on, because it gets gradually bigger, well, the same thing is true. It gets gradually smaller as you get closer. So a minute of angle is about a half of an inch at 50 yards and about a quarter of an inch at 25 yards. So if you need to move four inches to the left at 25 yards, you actually need to move 16 minutes of angle because there's four of those quarters in every inch. So four times the four, you have to move 16 minutes adjustment to get back to it. Uh, if it were me and I had a decent scope that I could at least semi-trust, I probably wouldn't even shoot again. I would just go ahead and go to the 100 yards and making that bold adjustment is at least going to get me on the target of 100. Then when I'm on the target of 100, I'm going to, you know, zero it in. I'm going to take and shoot at least three rounds to see what the group looks like. And then I'm going to make an adjustment from the center of that group to the center of the target. Uh, don't be afraid to make bold adjustments. And this is true almost always when shooting. Uh, I see people err often on the side of making too small of an adjustment, not very often making too big of an adjustment. That's one reason. Uh, the other reason I want you to make a bold adjustment is moving too far past the target where you want to be is actually kind of a good thing when you're trying to zero it because then you know exactly how much to come back. So if you have a big adjustment to make, you need to move 10 minutes at 100 yards, let's say. And you're not quite sure it's 8-ish, 9-ish, 10-ish. You're not measuring with a ruler. You're just looking down range. You're like, ah, uh, maybe let's move 9. <coughs> Excuse me. You move nine minutes and it only gets about two thirds of the way. Now you got to go, well, if that was two thirds, let's move another couple more minutes. And what you do is you slowly walk your rounds in. Well, instead, if you need to move, it looks about 10, just move 12. Go ahead, move past the target. And if you shoot, chances are you might actually be on the target. But if you actually adjust it too far the other way, for me at least, it's much easier to see exactly how much to come back. So if I moved the 12 and it was two minutes too far, I knew it was exactly 10. Uh, it's easier for some reason uh, than inching your way into the target. This is especially true when you're dealing with wind calls and you're shooting at targets downrange. Uh, don't sit there and walk your way into the target, especially don't walk your way into the edge of the target. Uh, new uh, long-range students do that all the time. Uh, let's give an example. They are shooting at 600 yards on a uh, E-type target, so a you know, military E-type target, so it's a torso-sized target, okay? Maybe this wide, that wide, half a meter wide. Is that about half a meter? And they end up missing six inches off their right edge at 600 yards. And some of the students immediately go, oh, six inches, 600 yards, that's about in the middle of the angle. So we're going to hold about a minute to the left, let's say, because they missed off the right edge. And I have to come running up and go, no, 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 stop. First off, they're not making a bold adjustment. That's a little tiny adjustment. Well, the other problem is they're moving to the edge of the target. Adjusting that one minute of angle to move the six inches, yeah, that's how much they missed by. That's how much they missed the entire target by, but that's not how much they missed where they were aiming by, where they're aiming should have been in the center of the target. So if they adjust those six inches over, let's say they were exactly right on their wind call, they might split the bullet in half when they nick the edge of the target. And if the wind picked up any more at all, or they slightly didn't adjust enough, there's going to be another miss. So they would need to adjust to the center of the target. I would come over three minutes of angle. Give me the six inches to the edge and give me another 12 inches into the center of the target. So another reason to adjust boldly is even if you're wrong and you go too far, it's easy to go back and, and make another adjustment. So uh, I get myself zeroed. I, I get it in. I confirm it. Uh, while I'm in the prone position, I get as stable as possible. If there's benches there, I'll use the benches and bags and sandbags. It's okay to not test yourself with you know, different shooting positions when you're trying to zero you want to remove as many variables as possible. So whatever you're doing that you think might be cheating while you're zeroing, great, that's good. You want a baseline of that rifle and that scope to line up on that target just fine. So once you get it zeroed, uh, I'm probably going to stop and slip my scales at that point. That's where I'm going to take and adjust my uh, turrets so that the elevation and windage knobs actually read zero. On, on many scopes, that's different. On some of the loophole scopes, for example, you adjust uh, three little set screws in the turret, which loosens the grip of that turret's cap. Now, not the cap that would cover a turret, but the actual thing you're grabbing and turning usually isn't the mechanism inside, right? There's really like a post inside the scope sticking up at the top. And this little cap is clamped on with three set screws. And that's what you see with the numbers, and that's what you turn that turns the knob inside. Well, when I'm zeroing, now the numbers on the outside cap might say 12. Well, I want them to say zero. So what I'll do is release those three set screws, which will loosen the cap. 
I will move the cap without adjusting that internal mechanism. So if you turn it and you hear it clicking at all, you know you didn't loosen these screws enough. You loosen the screws and make sure the cap just turns loosely to the zeros lined up, and then I retighten them. Then when I make an adjustment up from zero, it'll actually turn the mechanism. That's called slipping your scales. And so then you get both turrets to read zero, zero. And then when you go to shoot again, you're gonna be good. Now, I'm a big believer in getting your mechanical zero, but you can do that later in the day. I mean, I want you to confirm throughout that day that your zero is really good. If you have uh, ammo that you intend on using and you wanted to use the cheap ammo first, of course, go ahead and confirm your good zero with your good ammo, but use the cheap ammo first to at least get on the target so you're not wasting the good ammo. Uh, this is also the times where I'd be checking the functioning of the gun. If it's a bolt gun, I'd be worried about, you know, how's the bolt moving? Is it binding at all? How are the magazines feeding? You know, how are things like that? Um, for guys that are worried about barrel break-in, I'm really not. Maybe I should be. Uh, this is a good time. You could be shooting a few rounds. You could stop and clean your barrel if you want, or you can go through your magic, you know, sprinkle uh, magic sniper dust on the gun and shoot one round and then clean with your left hand in the air and then shoot and then right hand in the air. <laughs> of course, I'm joking, but um, I, I get it. Shooters that are better than me believe in barrel break-in and that it needs to be done. Uh, knock yourself out. I kind of just shoot and clean as I go. I'm not too worried about it. No matter how much I break in this barrel with you know, copper and, and carbon and then breaking it back down, I'm going to mess it up sometime in the future anyway. And I'm hoping if you're getting into this, you're shooting a good quality barrel. You know, you take a off the factory barrel. Uh, yeah, you, you might need to do that. Matter of fact, there's probably a good chance depending on what you have. Uh, I had a really good friend of mine have a barrel that he described. It looked like a corn cob on the inside. It was so rough from the factory. So he shot and shot and cleaned and shot and cleaned. And the accuracy got better and better out of the gun. But it wasn't because he did some magic combination of this many bullets and that many cleanings. It's just that he had to wear the barrel in. So you feel like it matters and you want to knock yourself out with an exact regimen, go to it, not going to fault you for it. Um, but also don't buy too much into, you know, products that, well, I have these special bullets. They're going to, they're going to help polish my barrel in. No, if you have a decent enough barrel that's supposed to be accurate, you're just ruining the barrel. And the barrel manufacturers are going to love you for it because you're going to have to buy another barrel, but it's going to be fine. Just shoot it. You know, I've even seen, you know, like some powder like that CFE 223, I think it's called. That's that, that powder that's supposed to have some mechanism in there to help clean some of the copper fouling out as you shoot. Great. I, I bet it works. I mean, people that know way more about powder designed it than I do. But I was at the range not too long ago um, and really had to try hard not to laugh. Uh, I just stayed back and, and, and was, was polite. But I overheard uh, one of these younger guys that came out there with all this really cool, fancy equipment. Didn't know what he was doing, really. But he was reloading and, and trying to shoot. And he was screaming to the other people at the range, yeah, I'm loading this new CFE powder, and it's got this you know, special copper remover. And so whenever I'm done with the string, I shoot a bunch through in really fast succession to help clean the copper out. And so as the range would get ready to go cold, he'd see the timer going down. He jumped on his gun. It was an AR. And he got behind it, looked at the berm, and just pa 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 shot a 20-round magazine as fast as he could. <laughs> I shook my head and thinking, what? And when he got done and the range was cold, he took his earmuffs off and the, the guy next to him questioned him again, like, you said you do what now? And so he tried to explain it again. He goes, well, you know, it's got this solvent in there that helps clean the copper out. Well, all he was doing was putting 20 rounds in quick succession of copper adding into his barrel, which, by the way, he's shooting fast, so he's probably going to get more heat, probably more copper off anyway. So, sure, I guess it helps, but it's not going to help so much that it's going to just completely undo whatever you're doing by shooting more. But he bought some product. He's supporting an industry. Um, God bless him. Appreciate he's doing it. But I think he might be focusing on the wrong area. So, so don't, don't do that. So after I uh, confirm it's zeroed, I hope I'm at a range where I have some distance. And I'll start playing with it. If it's a, a, a round I'm familiar with, um, I know what the elevation adjustments are going to be at different distances. So I'll start playing with those. Uh, take a pause real quick. Blaine just made a comment for us on here. If I only I were his math and physics teacher in school, uh, Blaine, I would have loved it. I, I absolutely love teaching. Um, for some of you guys that know, I uh, I still teach right now at the university. That's actually how um, I met my wife. I was teaching at a community college. That story's for later. But I've been teaching uh, here and there, guest lecturing, and now I lecture at the University of Alabama. I teach constitutional law, and I love it. It's absolutely so much fun. Uh, so yeah, Blaine, I would have loved teaching it. Um, 
I know I can't get into it yet, but I'll hint at the fact that maybe you guys should check out the next Recoil magazine. Maybe there'll be an article from me that's kind of math intensive about long range shooting. That's a, that's all I'll say. But I appreciate the support. Um, glad you like it. I hope you got the book, Blaine. Uh, I, I explained a bunch of math and physics stuff in there for you guys. And the advanced book, which I hope will come out by December. Which I know that's not going to happen, but I'm really going to try. It's going to be a lot more math and physics intensive. And I'm going to warn you all in that first chapter that you think you could jump to the advanced book because you know so much. I want to quiz you in that first chapter and put a few things in there that says, hey, if you don't know these topics as well as, as I'm explaining them here, like you should, maybe you should go get the beginning book first. I called it beginning because I didn't want people to be afraid of it. That's honestly the reason I did it. It's not a beginning book. I mean, it starts at the beginning because I want to make sure we're all on the same page, but it gets into some pretty advanced stuff. I mean, we're talking Coriolis effect. We're talking Yotvos effect. We're talking different types of ogives on bullets. We get into some pretty, uh, pretty advanced stuff, but the advanced book will be even more so. So uh, let's get back to some of the comments. So I, I hope that's helping you guys understand what I do with the range. I'll go out to different distances. Maybe I'll start writing down some of my dope. I'm not going to go crazy about a dope book at this point. Uh, for those of you that keep insane dope books, good for you. Um, I like index cards. Uh, in the Long Range Shooting Handbook, I talk about how uh, a dope book really is kind of an overused thing. You know, maybe it's the blasphemy. I don't know. There's There's some sniper people now. Some sniper instructors are probably screaming right now. But record every single thing that is going to be useful to you later. That's it. That's my stance on dope books. So if for you, uh, the fact that two butterflies flew by is, is useful to you somehow, you know how to take that information and apply it in the future, uh, then great. Write down that two butterflies went by you. Um, but if that doesn't matter to you, don't write it down. Because what you're going to do is these guys often that are diehard dope book guys, not all of you, but most of you that I've run into, have dope books that have just all this data in there and it's great i mean they can have years of information in there and they always look at me funny when i see their book and they go, hey what do you think about this and i open it up and i go wow this is this is so much information and wow it's so detailed and look every round so not only did you show me the group you told me which was the third and the fourth round in the group that's amazing but i got a question for you so what and they go what do you mean i say so so what that that was the third round and that was the fourth round? And they go, well, it's important to be able to analyze the group. And I said, okay, okay, then tell me. How is this different? What are you going to do different? That Because the third round was the bottom left and the fourth round was the bottom right. What, what, how is that different to you? What, what are you going to change? What are you going to sustain? What does that mean in the long run? And normally, they're honest enough to go, huh, I guess you got a good point. I guess it doesn't matter. Or they'll have so many pages of information with all the temperature, which does matter, and all the wind conditions, which, yes, matter, and, and all these other uh, effects they've written down, and, you know, the lot numbers of their ammo and everything. And so even they'll take information that does matter, like the temperature, but they'll have it just one page after the next chronologically, but then I'll ask them, how are you going to use this? And how are you going to reference it? You're at the range right now. You need to make a shot of the target right now. Here's your dope book. What do you do? And if they have it, figured out they probably have a page at the back of the book or in the front of the book or they'll have an index card in there which is what i like to use and they'll end up having their cheat sheet all written down on that one index card they'll have consolidated the info that is useful but what that is then is they're carrying around a log book a diary of information and then one useful card of what they can reference when it comes to the temperature data because you're not gonna be able to flip through and go man i wonder when i found another day where it was 59 degrees and the sun was in my eyes You'd have to flip through every page to find it. And then when you do find it, you're going to go, oh, the altitude was different. Or the humidity was different. Or that was a different lot number of ammo. It's going to be something different anyway. So take notes, which is why I like the index cards. Get home. When you go to clean your gun or you go to reload next time, pull those index cards out and see if there's anything new. If they confirmed what you already know for your gun and, and your ammo, great. Just write them down for your log round count or write down the experience. But if there's something new on there, if it was a unique variable, unique something, then go to a master sheet where you can find that 80 degrees you know, temperature with that altitude and write in the information and consolidate it to something useful so you're not carrying around this, this uh, dope book that has a whole bunch of information. So I might start taking you know, logs of what I'm doing. I might start keeping the targets, shooting multiple targets to see what the gun does. 
you know, we'll get into testing loading later when we talk about reloads. Um, this was also something that came in the last couple of weeks. You guys apparently figured out that I have free targets. Yes, I have a few free targets for you on the book's website. You go to longrangeshootinghandbook.com and go check out the section that says targets. There's some free targets to download. And I made those because I like using them. And the zero target is a diamond, which I've liked that other people have done in their targets where it allows me to better line up the crosshairs of the diamond because in a circle or a square, I'm always guessing where center is. Well, with the diamond, the, 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 the peaks of the diamond on the top, bottom, left, and right line up really good with the reticle. And the actual reticle makes a cool little shape with little like triangles of white left of the diamond when it's dead center. So it's really nice. And then I can bring my eyes back to focus on my reticle like I should be doing anyway. I like those. I also put a one inch grid on that target so you can see what one minute of angle looks like at 100 yards. And for those of you that are still learning what minutes of angle are and how to zero, small and small numbers on the, the corner, I actually put the left and right adjustments you need in minutes of angle depending on your distance. So to the line one inch to the right of the center for the target, it actually says left one at 100, which means if you're shooting at 100 yards and your center of your group was lined up with that line, you need to go left one minute of angle, left one at 100. But then it says left two at 50 and left four at 25. So it reminds you if you're shooting at 25 yards and your bullets are on that line, you need to go left four minutes of angle. So I do all the math for you. I have it all lined up. Um, I think it's handy. So they're free, guys. It's just a PDF. Go to my website, grab them, download them, print them out, hand them out to as many people as you want, and have fun. Um, I also like them because they're easy to take down and cheap. I mean, it's printer paper, right? You can keep them, and that would be a good logbook at home, too, to start keeping track of what groups did, and you can write on it what kind of ammo it was. So that's a good way to keep a, a notebook of what that rifle's doing. Um, by the time I've shot at different distances and I've function tested the rifle and I've got it zeroed, I don't know, I maybe through 40 or 60 rounds. That's kind of about it. Uh, unless I'm doing something like three-gun shooting, which I absolutely love, or I'm going out and just plinking, uh, I'm not going to shoot more than probably 40 rounds, 60 rounds in a long day. You know, it either just gets expensive or I might be just be wasting my time. Um, so, yeah, that's what a range day looks like to me. And uh, Maybe go over and do something else to break it up and go shoot pistol or something. So that was Eli's question, how to start at the range. Uh, oh, let me get you an update on Jason real quick. Uh, one, sorry he couldn't make it. He's going to be on the next podcast for us. But two, we started this search for his Air 15 lowers. We were talking about that last podcast. He was looking at his lower receivers. And we talked a little bit about the difference between uh, forged and billet receivers. And after the podcast, he was convinced he wanted forged because of what we had talked about. And it didn't take a day for him to call me back and go, okay, I want to do billet instead. He ran across a local shop that does some really cool looking billet receivers. And I had to laugh and say, okay, yeah, I get it. They look cooler sometimes. And these ones came in some cool anodized colors. And uh, he might end up getting those. So we'll have to see. But he went to Palmetto State Armory. And he said that the night of the podcast, he looked at those receivers I was recommending. And there's tons of them. And then like within a day, they were all gone. So he and I were joking that we'd like to give ourselves credit. But <laughs> we know it was just probably timing. Of people looking for things so next podcast we're going to have to ask jason what he finally decided uh which receivers he's going to get and then we're going to jump into talking about the lower parts kits because he's already ready to get those parts and then as the series goes along of course we'll, we'll build his rifle completely so uh, i mentioned fundamentals earlier and i said that i'm going to explain how they may not apply to you well this is because of something i saw earlier someone had seen a um a picture of somebody shooting and and had commented on how it looked like they had improper trigger control. Well, if we subscribe to what the in vogue, the current way to have trigger control in a pistol, yeah, maybe they, they, they did compared to that. But this person was a multinational record holder. And I think they probably know better pistol trigger control than I do. Uh, so maybe what they're doing is actually better. And I don't bring it up to, to pick on the point of the picture or maybe the trigger control, I just bring up to remind you guys, you're going to find my book, you're going to find other books, you're going to find YouTube videos, you're going to find um, people in gun stores, they're going to tell you, oh, no, 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 this is how you do it. This is what proper follow through is like. Well, no, I'm, I'm going to tell you what proper follow through is like for me, how I like to think about it, how I've seen maybe other students find a good way to do it. But I even admit in the book that this is just a method. This is just what works for me. And I'm asking you to try it. So at least if you don't like it, you at least know why you don't like it. So you don't just kind of hate the method. Maybe you really hate the method, but at least you'll know why. Or you can 
like it, but it doesn't work the best for you and, and do what some people call the toolbox method. You take it and just put that tool away in your toolbox. And if someday ever comes up that it'd be handy to use that tool, you can go pull it back out of that toolbox and use it. But if for some reason um, you flinch really bad before you pull the trigger, but you shoot one whole groups, you shoot you know, a quarter minute of the angle every single time by flinching before you pull the trigger. Yeah, I'm probably going to try to get you to stop flinching. I'm probably going to try and talk to you about how uh, you can anticipate the shot and how you shouldn't be doing that. I'll probably give you dry practice and try and get good trigger control. But after a little bit, if you're still shooting amazing groups by flinching, uh, I hope I have the ability and to be a good enough instructor to let you flinch. I mean, yeah, it'd be great for you to fit the textbook mold, but maybe you just don't. Maybe. Uh, you have the better technique and you accidentally stumbled upon it and maybe through some uh, evolution of technique we can learn from your anomaly and we can all get better from you. So just because someone says this is, this is the way you do it, yeah, you should try it because maybe people that have, have had more experience than you have had good luck that way and there might be good mechanical reasoning behind it. If it doesn't work for you and if some other way works better and it's not unsafe and it's repeatable, then... Who am I to tell you not to do the, the flinching? I mean, you point the gun uh, a mil to the left of every target and you jerk the trigger so hard that you, you know, jerk the trigger back to where the reticle lines up the target by the time the gun goes off. And that actually works for you and you could do it the exact same every time. I mean, the exact same. You'd be the most accurate shooter in the world. I mean, who would I be to stop that? So just remember that it's good to have. Uh, a good grasp of the fundamentals. It's good to start with the fundamentals, but don't wrap your head around it. If it's not working for you, you know, if if you have a body type uh, that doesn't allow you to get in the position I describe, I mean, heck, you might have a disability on on how to, to lay behind a rifle to shoot, and it might not work for you. That doesn't mean you have to stop shooting. Um, I have a friend of mine, I should probably get on this podcast. Uh, he shoots three gun. I've shot a, a few three gun matches with him. I don't know, maybe a bunch. But he has no hands and he smokes me. Okay. Guy has no hands. Okay. He goes by the nickname nubs because he has nubs on his arms and he will shoot three gun shotgun, rifle and handgun and beat me every single time. So I couldn't sit there and stop him and go, no, you're, you're doing it wrong. See proper trigger control is taking your index finger and on this crease, or you need to pull with this hand here. Cause guess what? He doesn't have fingers. So that doesn't mean he should give up. That means he's adapted for himself and he's been able to do it anyway. I'll get off my soapbox, but uh, stop everybody when you're out there teaching people at the range, harping so much on the fundamentals, or this is what tactical Dan so-and-so taught me. Uh, great, try it, but it may not be the only way. I mean, think about some of the stuff that, you know, Colonel Jeff Cooper was teaching. Great, great, great stuff, but we've evolved past that. You know, if we went out there and yelled at everybody shooting three gun, Hey, you're not shooting Weaver. You're not reloading this way. That's what they used to teach at Gunsight a while ago. That was the fundamentals. Well, good thing we've learned. People tried something different, and I'm glad they did, so we're not all the same. So, all right, really, I'm off the soapbox now. So, John's email, he was someone else that wrote in. He was asking about the typical range trip. He also asked about what follow-through after the shot was like for me. So, let me address that real quick. Uh, follow-through after the shot. When I just told you fundamentals, for me... Um, I like to picture drawing my finger in the sand. This is what I describe to people. Again, might not work for you. I either lay next to them when they're in the prone and put my finger in the dirt, trigger finger in the dirt, and just pull a straight line and draw a line back to me. And I tell them that's what trigger control to me is like. It is a, it is an event. It's not just a thing that happens. I am, as I'm drawing that line, I'm imagining adding pressure, 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 pressure to the trigger. Gun goes off and I keep adding that pressure. So if they put their finger back on the trigger and they imagine drawing that line with their finger, even though it's not really moving because it's on the trigger, or it's not moving as much as the line is, they can get the concept of your building, 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 building goes off and you keep doing that. So if you keep doing after the gun goes off what you were doing before the gun goes off, to me, that's great follow through. Uh, the way I can tell you're doing it is one, I can see bad groups in the target, but two, I can look at you, which is where a good coach should be looking anyway, because the problem is likely happening with you. The results in the target are just the symptom of the problem. Is I'll see your finger jumping off that gun while it's recoiling. Uh, I know you're not having good follow through. Now, for me, my good follow through, what I think is good follow through, is a split second. I mean, gun goes off, split second follow through, then I back off and reloading. 
because I want to be getting the gun back up and running. I want to be calling my shot. I'm not going to sit there for an exaggerated multiple seconds and hold the follow through like I would have a student do. I'm having a student do it, not for them, but for me, so I can see that they listened and they're actually doing follow through. Uh, John also asked if I can spot my own rounds shooting through the rifle. Uh, not on most rifles, no. On my SPR in the military, I could, because it was an AR-15, so it was a small enough bullet. The, the OpSync silencer on it was so awesome. Uh, heavy enough out there with bipod legs and really nestled down in the rifle. Yeah, you could actually shoot at distance and, and watch the impacts. It was really cool and maybe one of the reasons I like that rifle. But no, you shouldn't be focusing anyway, even if you could, on where your shot went, because you shouldn't be looking at the target. You should be thinking about looking at the reticle. You should be thinking about good trigger control. You should be thinking about good follow through. And when that's over, all I want you to be doing is reloading and calling that shot. Your brain should be focusing only on where the reticle was when the gun went off, not where the bullet is going. That's actually a distraction. Don't worry about that. That's after the fact. That's for the spotter to worry about. So I, I hope that helped. Um, let me see if I can address some of the more of the comments that are coming here on, on Facebook. Uh, Kelly writes in and says, Hey, Clack, thoughts on the new school that you don't need a data book as long as you have a Kestrel? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, one is I don't own a Kestrel. I need to get one, though. <laughs> I really do. Um, I don't own a Kestrel, though, because, one, I don't like relying upon them, although they can be useful tools. But even the guys that do use them, they tell you the wind where you're at, and the wind where you're at isn't the wind that really necessarily matters completely. I mean, yes, it matters, but the wind also matters halfway to the target and all the way at the target and, and everywhere in between. So if the wind at you wasn't moving, let's say, because you were, let's take an extreme example, you were shooting um, out of a nice boxed-in range that was a complete overhang, complete walls, no wind was getting to you, you pulled out your Kestrel, you're going to see zero wind, but the wind might be straight left to right, you know, 20 miles an hour. Your Kestrel would tell you zero, and so you wouldn't do anything about it. You know, or if you had your Kestrel and the exact opposite was true, you were the way you were on the ridge, the wind was going left to right, but just a quarter of the way to the target, the wind was changing, going the other direction all the way to the target, you would get an artificial reading where you're at. The other reason I don't necessarily like them is it's one more thing to have out in your hands instead of shooting. Uh, I've often joked that if I were back to the military and for some reason there was some Hollywood sniper on sniper you know, moment, uh, that sounded weirder than I expected it to be. Uh, sniper, counter sniper moment. I hope the other sniper would be pulling out a Kestrel and reading it because I would just shoot through the Kestrel. Um, I could shoot, see an impact a little lower left, reload and shoot again before somebody could take a Kestrel and read the data, get the data, read it, and then uh, calculate it, figure out what to do. Now, I know not everyone's doing that. Some of you guys are really worried about that first round being exactly where it needs to be in the competition. So, sure, get one and use one. Um, they're not bad tools. I just told you I'm going to end up getting one. I just, they're not necessary. When you're starting out, I don't want you to use one as a crutch. Uh, the one good thing they are for is for environmental conditions like the temperature and humidity and things like that. And they came out with a new device that's kind of a smaller uh, device that can clip onto your bag and it talks to your iPhone and gives you the environmental data. That's actually kind of cool. I like that. Um, so, yeah, go get a Kestrel. You want to throw some love my way, go click on the link through the Long Range Shooting Handbook's website in the chapters for gear because Amazon lets me uh, wet my beak a little bit when you when you purchase the item. So I, I'd appreciate that if you're going to get one. Uh, when I do get one, I'll give you a thorough review and tell you what I think about it and how great it is because everyone else must love them. But the reason you definitely shouldn't do what you're asking, Kelly, is you don't need a dope book. Well, what happens if your Kestrel dies? What happens if you forget your Kestrel? Which I guess you can forget your dope book. I get it. but it's just hopefully one's a backup for the other. What happens when you have the conditions are different, like I mentioned? Even even worse, the Kestrel tells you what the environmental conditions are. So what? How do you know what that has anything to do with your rifle? I get it. Some people want to use the Kestrel along with ballistic software, or some of the Kestrels have the ballistic software in there. Great. But every single guy I know that swears by their ballistic software, if they're honest enough, will admit that it's not accurate, or it's not as accurate as it should be. Now, they say it is, and they, oh, no, it's great, it's dead on, it's amazing what it can do, and I changed, and this one time I went here, and the Kestrel, the ballistic calculator, told me to change this, and it worked. That's awesome. There's also nine out of the ten times, though, where they say they either forget, or they don't, just don't want to admit it, or I've seen countless times. They pull it out, they get the ballistic software, it's like, oh, I need to come up this amount. They try it, and they shoot it, it doesn't work. 
And they scratch their head. They're like, huh? And they look back and they, they fiddle with, oh, well, maybe I'll, I'll tweak the BC of my bullet a little bit. Or maybe I'll tweak this. They try it again. Oh, now it's a little low. I'll tweak this. Oh, okay. And they'll dial it in anyway. So it ends up not being this first round hit the majority of the time. They'll remember the time it was, but the majority of the time it's not. Uh, because every gun's a little different. Every scope's a little different. Every Everything is different. And so that ballistic software may not know that your scope doesn't track very well. Now, yes, you can input the data and you can go from there, but what you've done when you input the data from your scope into the software is you've kind of just made yourself a dope book electronically. So, Kelly, no, uh, don't avoid the dope book just with the Kestrel. Get a Kestrel if you want. It's just another tool. You don't always have to use it if you don't want to, so it's not really a negative. It's just something to carry around with you. Um, use one. I'm going to get one. I'm going to start using one. But your dope book should at least be even an index card. A dope book can be a piece of masking tape inside your scope cap that has things written down. But that's what's going to be able to be referenced when your batteries are dead in a bad condition to remember what's going on with your rifle. That's what's going to help you take notes when you're at the range and you had something different happen. If you don't have a dope book, where are you going to write it down? You're going to think you're going to remember. When you get back, you're not going to remember what's going on. So, no, go ahead and get both if you want. That's the way to go. Uh, Blaine has another comment. says, I saw your video from the NSSF on YouTube. We were talking about dope. The spring spool that fit in your scope looks pretty neat. Do I like that better than a card? Uh, no, I like the card better. You know, I actually, what I like most is just a piece of tape inside my scope cap with the dope written in it that I think I'm going to need. Um, but you want to carry extra information in your shooting bag. That's when you have the different environmental stuff. That's when you have the more info. But honestly, I, I have most of my dope pretty memorized. I mean, to get close enough and a quick shot. So if I, if I need to hit, you know, a 550 yard target, I know kind of where to go. I'm going to go about 13 and a half minutes. That's what I'm gonna shoot for my 308. Um, if the situation is different, of course I can I can plan for that. The tape thing was pretty neat. Loophole made that. I don't think they make it anymore. That's just one more mechanical thing to break though, as you pull it out and go back. That's also a lot of movement. Uh, the card is kind of nice because you can just lay it in front of you or study you the night before without having to get your gun out of your case. Um, but hey, whatever works for you. A piece of tape on the side of the gun, great. If you don't mind having to move your head to look at it, uh, that, that that's uh that's fine with me. So I appreciate you guys tuning in. That's all I have planned uh, to cover this podcast. On the next one, we definitely will have Jason involved and we'll be talking about his AR-15 project and where we're going with that. Uh, reminder here, guys, spread the word, please. Uh, if you guys like the free info that you're getting on the podcast, good. I like doing it. But let everyone else know about it so we can get more people subscribed. We can get more people listening to it. Uh, I mentioned the laser app training system and I went ahead and I put out a tweet and a little Instagram thing of it to, uh, today, I think. That system is awesome i play with it i bring it with me on trips last time i went down to texas triggers i brought it with me there and we were there with some of the guests sitting around a conference table uh completely away from firearms right before dinner having some drinks playing with this game because it's a laser trainer so you can do it when you're not at the range and you can designate whatever you wanted in the room to be the targets i actually took notepads like this and stacked them up against the wall and in the software, you can just designate exactly that square you want to be the target. Or you can put it, you can make it a circle somewhere else. And you can make up your own games. And we had it calling out the notepads and number. And we're sitting with a laser training pistol. Click, 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 hitting with it. And the software sees where the laser dot is and it scores it for you. It's a blast. Um, I hope more people find out about it. More people use it. It's Laser App. L-A-S-R. A-P-P. So they spell laser kind of funny. L-A-S-R-A-P-P dot com. I'll put a link in the show's notes. And uh, one, I'm telling you about it because they're good guys. Two, I'm telling you about it because it's a really fun product and I love playing with it. But three is they give you a discount. So they're giving you like me some support and I appreciate it. If in the coupon code section, you just put my last name, they give you 10% off. So just put in Kleckner, C-L-E-C-K-N-E-R at checkout and they give you 10% off of the software. So come on, you can't beat that. Uh, another discount thing you can see is I put on the Long Range Shooting Handbook's Facebook page. It's for govx.com, G-O-V-X.com. It's open to all current and former uh, government employees. So military, police, fire, EMTs, um, ATF, DOJ, just all those uh, employees, either past or, past or present, you get some awesome discounts on some cool gear. Uh, some of the stuff I was looking at today is 60% off. Most of it's about 20 to 30% off. But it's all the gear you guys want. It's Oakley's, it's Pelican cases, it's it's 511 clothes. It's just all sorts of cool gear, and you have to join. So you have to meet the threshold of proving that you legitimately were able to get this discount. But all these companies allow you to have these awesome discounts. 
And if you join with the link that I shared on the Long Range Shooting Handbook, uh, if it reminds me, I'll put it on the show's notes also. If you use that link to join at GovX, it's free to join, uh, you get 15 bucks off your first order. So that's cool. And they throw a little uh, a bonus my way too for you joining. So you're helping support uh, the show here and, and everything I'm doing. And I'd really appreciate it. So you need to check that out. Um, I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, chiming in with the comments, guys. I really appreciate the emails uh, with the questions. Uh, be safe out there. And if you have any comments or questions, you know where I'm at. Uh, Until next time, everybody have a nice night. Take care.